This comes from someone who claims to be a former forensic investigator that worked for a few precincts in upstate New York. To clarify, I have no personal ties to this person, don't know why they specifically reached out to me, or felt this page was their only remaining option to tell their story. I'm simply passing along what they said, and I'll leave it to you for your own interpretation. After conducting my own research, however, I will say their theories are plausible, and whoever this is genuinely believes they've uncovered something heinous. Here's the account I received, told in their point of view. I worked as a forensic investigator in New York State's Delaware and Columbia counties. I've seen my fair share of crime scenes, from child suicides at ages they had no business of even entertaining such thoughts, to gruesome accidents and murder victims killed in the worst ways imaginable. There were three particular cases whose backstories compelled me to dig deeper, even after the official investigations concluded. What I found made me question the extents of reality, human depravity, and avarice. The first happened in East Chatham, December 1986. A teen, who I'll refer to as Will, murdered four of his family members, seeming to be driven by financial gain. All four bodies were discovered in their bedrooms, dying from gunshot wounds to the head. Despite being described as a shallow, detached individual, Will excelled in school and was thought to have a bright future. His family was very active in the community and owned a successful business, which made these murders especially stunning. The teen readily confessed when questioned, but wasn't very forthcoming on certain crime scene details. Dozens of candles placed on top of coins scattered around the house, inscriptions written in blood on the living room floor, most of which we couldn't document because they were repeatedly tracked over before we arrived and the bodies all being smeared with an oily, light green substance. The coroner reports on all four bodies describe their wounds as narrow, bullet-shaped holes entering through the victim's forehead and exiting through the back. The exit wounds look nothing like those made by bullets. No casings or rounds were found, and tests for gunpowder residue were incidentally damaged at the lab by a pipe burst. While the official report said all four victims died from gunshots, it was never technically proven. Thinking they had sufficient evidence, detectives saw no need to investigate further after Will confessed and overlooked these bizarre details. Although they determined Will, who claimed to have no recollection of that night, suffered a psychotic breakdown, I always suspected he had an ulterior motive. Any attempts at deciphering what was written on the living room floor were futile, except for one semi-legible phrase, Judic. The light green slippery substance slathered on all four bodies was also identified as money oil, an herbal remedy used in witchcraft that supposedly brings prosperous wealth. Although many acknowledged there was a lot more going on, everyone ultimately wanted to move forward and minimize the attention East Chatham was receiving from this tragedy. In the end, I understood the desire to put this dark chapter of East Chatham's history behind us and eventually accepted I wouldn't learn any more about what happened than what was already known. Fast forward a few years later, when I was working in Delaware County, the second case happened in June 1989, another mass murder that conjured up memories of East Chatham. A 23-year-old, I'll call Evan, murdered his family at their cabin outside Stamford. Lit candles placed on top of coins littered the home where four bodies were found in the house's attic. Initially perceived as gunshots, the autopsy report explained their wounds as being bullet-shaped entrances that went completely through the victim's body. Unlike the East Chatham killings, these murder victims contained several deep perforations. The bodies were centered around a strange symbol that seemed to depict a blocky, crookedly drawn uppercase B. A small backwards J protruded from the B's lower left corner while a jagged uppercase T branched off its top left end. 
The emblem was drawn with a scorched powder that, based on samples recovered, had an initial light green color and was composed of different herbs. It looked like Evan had been interrupted in the middle of whatever he was doing, prompting him to flee. He was cornered at an abandoned farm in a neighboring county, which ensued a lengthy standoff. Before being gunned down after opening fire on police, officers on scene recalled Evan kept screaming. He was so close, needed to complete the circle and finish the process. One bizarre piece of evidence was a black envelope Evan pinned on his family's business storefront sometime after committing the murders. It was covered in green wax and contained burnt remnants of paper that, from what few strands were salvaged, appeared to be some kind of letter or note. Although Evan apparently had severe mental issues, this dismissive explanation for his appalling actions disregarded some alarming details. Evan was apparently obsessed with money and wealth, to the point where it influenced him at a cognitive level. He stood to assume his entire family's estate, which, according to friends of his, Evan incessantly pondered about the liquid value of and what he'd do with all that cash. When I disputed the investigation's conclusions, my police chief gave a familiar explanation. Evan is dead, he said. No need to allocate time and resources to an already solved case. Even after noting every similarity with the East Chatham murders, he wouldn't entertain any further inquiries and eventually reassigned me to another division. It was after this I learned the powdery substance found in the attic was identified as money powder, which had many similar ingredients as its counterpart, money oil. Despite violating orders and an abundance of department codes, I started my own secret investigation trying to connect these cases. There was too much overlap between them that I just couldn't let this go without leaving no stone unturned. Both killings were committed by young men with financial motives. They murdered their families in near identical manners, candles placed on top of coins, and substances made from the same materials were found at both crime scenes. Although I was convinced Will and Evan were trying to perform the same or closely related rituals, my evidence was circumstantial at best. I needed a direct link connecting them that would give my theory the credence necessary to be taken seriously. About a year into my independent probe, a case from February 1988 in Groveland, New York was brought to my attention. A man, I'll call him Larry, murdered his whole family before committing suicide and setting their house on fire. After extinguishing the blaze, police discovered five bodies. Larry killed his wife and three children, who were each found lying in their beds. Although gunshots were officially deemed all five victims' causes of death, Larry was the only one described as being explicitly caused by a firearm. His wife and kids died from what the documents described, as wounds closely resembling a gunshot that completely passed through the victim's cranial region. For me, there were two affirming details in this case that connected to the East Chatham and Stamford killings. Investigators determined the fire was started by lighting a charred black envelope. The note inside was too badly burned and no longer legible, but the envelope looked exactly like the one Evan pinned on his family storefront. Larry also had a tattoo on his back, matching the symbol found at the Stamford scene. A jagged B with an uppercase T and backwards J stemming from its corners. I also discovered Larry and his wife were having marital problems, which derived from a crippling financial situation that put them on the precipice of ruin. Finding this case led to more chilling discoveries. One regarded an owl rope bracelet with a gold wolf head charm Larry had on his wrist. Will wore the exact same bracelet when he was found. Despite living in Groveland when murdering his family, Larry settled there fairly recently. Not only did he own a business in East Chatham from 1983 to 85, where Will happened to work for eight months 
But the abandoned farmhouse where Evan made his final stand was on land formerly owned by Larry's family. I delved further into Larry's background. Although information was hard to come by, it led me to learning about Lupus Virtus, meaning green wolf in Latin. What little I found described them as some kind of fraternal order where Larry was a member. The only other details I uncovered about Lupus Virtus was they were formerly headquartered in a now abandoned lodge located somewhere between Medusa and South Westerlow, roughly the midway point between East Chatham and Stamford. The lodge burned down in the summer of 1989, after which the organization appeared to cease operations. The former lodge's dilapidated remains still stand today. I spent months trying to uncover more about Lupus Virtus, but had stagnant progress and came to a barrage of dead ends. Shortly after, however, my rogue investigation was halted after being discovered by the DA's office. Although no charges were pressed, the police confiscated most of my documents and case files, after which I was swiftly terminated. A few years passed when something seemingly out of the blue happened that dragged me back down this rabbit hole. I woke up one morning to find hundreds of papers littering the room where they were kept. Written on every one of these papers was a six-letter word, Mammon. It was written in what appeared to be blood, and I initially neglected to mention the filing cabinet holding these old documents was in my bedroom. I couldn't let anyone know these files were still in my possession, so I took to the internet where I gained a lot of perturbing insight on this word's meaning. Mammon was a theological demonic entity representing greed and want who promised its worshippers boundless wealth. I almost fell over after first seeing Mammon's sigil a distorted B with an uppercase T and backwards J jutting from its upper and lower left corners. It was the same symbol found in Will's attic and tattooed on Larry's back. This led me to read up on different rituals for summoning Mammon. They varied in complexity and many involved using specific items like candles, coins, owl rope, herbal remedies like money oil and powder, along with writing letters and requests to Mammon that you burn or place in black envelopes. I was especially bothered by a detail of Mammon's appearance that was in quite a few visual depictions of the being. Many had Mammon brandishing a long narrow spike that retracted from its wrist, which was used to impale its victims' bodies. The stories I read said Mammon extracted people's souls in this grisly manner, which were added to a collection it amassed over the millennia. It made me think about the wounds every one of those cases murder victims had, which every report was quick to write off as gunshots. What else could create that type of opening? Were those poor souls truly at rest or suffering a far worse fate? Mammon also apparently frequented the form of a wolf, which made sense of the fraternal order being named Lupus Virtus and those owl rope bracelets worn by Will and Larry having wolf head charms. I also don't think the dates all three massacres occurred were randomly chosen. Will killed his family on December 13th when the Feast of St. Judic is held. Judic, the word we found written at the East Chatham crime scene, was a young wealthy prince who gave up his opulence to become a priest. He lived a life of modesty, solitude, and was said to be a staunch adversary of Mammon since he stood against everything the demon represented. Apparently, using blood to write names of you or your deity's antagonist is a form of mockery and scorn in occultism that supposedly appeases and empowers your idol. The Stamford murders happened on June 22nd, which falls on the summer solstice, whose signified period of growth is considered an opportune time to summon certain beings, and when the season of mammon begins. 
Larry's murder-suicide occurred on February 28, 1988, which fell on a leap year. In the dark arts, leap years are supposed to provide a window for spirits and other beings to enter our world. Mammon is often described as coming in and out of our world using these leap year portals. Having presented my facts, I'll now tell you what I believe happened. Lupus Virtus was secretly a cult dedicated to Mammon whose members sought wealth and prosperity. Some rituals for summoning this being say flesh and blood offerings yielded greater results based on enormity if done correctly and precisely. I suppose the magnitude of sacrificing one's family was thought to yield endless rewards from this being. Larry recruited Will and Evan, who became indoctrinated by the Order's teachings. My guess is Will failed to properly complete his ritual, causing him to undergo an irreversible mental breakdown. Evan appeared to have gotten interrupted while performing his, likely by police when they arrived at the house. Larry's situation was less clear. He was overcome with grief, either for botching or coming to grips on what he was actually doing during his ritual, and ended his life in response. And after how publicly the Stamford killings got, Lupus Virtus probably decided to vacate the area or go underground, which could explain why their lodge burned. I expectedly made waves when trying to get my findings reviewed. I should have seen it coming, but anyone who even gave me the time of day dismissed my report, saying the evidence was too disputable, circumstantial, and most insulting of all, inventive. I eventually gave up when my former precincts threatened me with legal action for not turning over all the files and documents I still had, who said I was rehashing settled business that had no need to be revisited. Things settled down for a while afterwards, until something that happened recently. I found a familiar looking black envelope among some of my spouse's belongings while cleaning out a room that we were renovating. After reading the recently dated letter it contained, I now know I'm not safe in my own home and have been closely watched by people I've known and loved for years on behalf of a certain aforementioned organization. I don't know who to trust or where I'll go, but hope making my story known will help anyone that is or suspects they're in a similar situation. This goes way deeper than expected. And those cases I used to put this puzzle together may only be the beginning of uncovering what other horrors this entity and its devout followers have committed.